Jerry, it's great to, to come and meet you in your home. Thank you. And um, this isn't an interview, it's a conversation. It's a conversation, us. yes. But um, I guess I'm just uh, I'm aware as we meet that the, the point our encounter is the intergenerational dimension. Yes. That you're an yes. older man and I'm a younger man. Yes. Uh -huh. And um, yeah, you began to say something um, before we turned the camera on about us uh, being mysteries to each other yes. sometimes across yes. the generations. Yes, across the generations. Mm -hmm. So I'm interested in, mm -hmm. in hearing more about that, about what that's like from the point of view of the, mm -hmm. an 87 year old. Yes. Well, I suppose at one time in my life, I mean, obviously by own youth, um, but I did a lot, of, as a Jesuit, I had to do a lot of study. Mm. Um, and then I taught uh, for about nine years, you know, I was teaching. So I was very much in touch with younger people at that time. This was way back in the, in the uh, well, we began in the 50s, mm. uh, but 60s, 70s, because then after eight years or nine years teaching, um, I became a chaplain at Glasgow University and that was in the late 60s, early 70s, at the time of the student revolution, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, throwing over everything, etc. Mm -hmm. um, so I was in close touch with them all those years. Uh, thereafter, I started working on spirituality. Out of the experience I'd had of the teaching, particularly chaplain at Glasgow University, I suddenly discovered there were a relatively small number of Catholics. I was chaplain to the Catholics, uh, staff and students. <coughs> um, the vast number of others um, of different denominations, mm. of different faiths, mm. and of no faith. Mm. So that was quite an experience, and I was in touch with the younger generation then. Since then, and out of that experience, I decided I wanted to work on spirituality, which at that time was not as fashionable as it is today. Today everyone's got to be, well, in some circles, everyone's got to be spiritual. Quite what you mean by it, God knows. <clears throat> but um, I've been a bit out of touch with the younger generation and I'm just fascinated to know more about it. Mm. Because I do not believe that they are a, a curious type of evolutionary uh, product, totally different from anything they've gone before. Mm. I still believe there are qualities in humanity which don't, they don't change. They change out in man, etc. But the essential thinking doesn't change. I mean, people still have longings, have hopes, have desires, have moods, go up and down, etc. How do you cope with it? And how do you make sense of it all? I think one of the um, symptoms of our contemporary world is that um, separation between the generations. Yes. I think as, as humans we're, um, we're designed in an evolutionary sense to live uh, tribally with, with different generations um, interacting and intermingling on a daily basis yes. from moment to moment really. Yes. So I think that's actually a really... Sit by the bell. I didn't know how to turn it off. <laughs> that could be edited out. Absolutely. <coughs> Pause for thought. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I do think that as as humans we are um, designed to exist in more of a like a tribal kind of context, um, where the different generations have a lot of interaction with each other. Yes. Yes. Um, and I think that's like a really big wound in our in our current contemporary societies, certainly in the West. Um, so would you say that we, we in the West today, as a society, we tend to be living as individuals uh, rather than closely knit together, that tribal type of existence. Very much so. Yeah. With lots of communication. So and, and the sharing of wisdom between generations. Between generations. Yeah. And I mean wisdom from 
children to adults as much as from adults to children or yes. from elders yes. to newborns and vice versa. Yes. That um, I think that range of experience is something that we're denied uh, and it has a really damaging effect at the moment. So isn't it an extraordinary thing that uh, whereas technologically we've never had such means of communication, mm. the mind-boggling, the means of communication, yet as the, me as the means advance, as we call it, actual communication lessens. Mm. Mm. It's, 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 a, it's a very strange thing. Mm. Um, we're, we're supposedly more connected. Yes. But... Um, that's perhaps in more of a, a digital sense or an yeah. information sense yeah. rather than a real a human sense or uh -huh. a communal sense or a spiritual yes. sense, I suppose. Yes. Um, uh -huh. So me sitting here talking with you just now, mm -hmm. um, I think it's, it's, uh, it's good to remember that there's, there's actually something mm -hmm quite magical that can happen just yes. when, when two people encounter each other, yes. that actually uh, mm -hmm. it's not just about tagging you as my friend yes. online as it were, yes. 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 it's actually it's, there's, there's a lot that we can, we can gain from the embodied eye to eye kind of experience, yes. um, mm -hmm. if you don't mind me sort of like being bold, like yes. in 15 years time you may not be around anymore. Uh, <laughs> True. <laughs> I would say the odds are, yes. Yeah. And so no. hopefully I will still be. And so I think there's yes. something really precious there yes. that, that, we're, that we're, we're crazy to deny ourselves, I think. Um, so. But it's interesting you say that because I feel it with. I seem to have gone from youth to old age without going in through an intervening part. You know, I mean, it's just right. in. The, in Recent years, I would say the last 15 years, slowly beginning to realise I'm getting, you know, towards elderly. And in the last few years, really feeling I am elderly, not mm. I'm moving towards elderliness. Mm. And one of the things that I feel most is there's a, there's a kind of lack of coherence in us as a, <laughs> as a people. We don't, we don't cohere. There's an individualism um, which has got out of hand and it's isolated us mm -hmm. so that we tend to live as distinct little monads, mm -hmm. each trying to protect itself in the best way it can. Um, and I think that makes for a very sad society, a society full of conflict. Um, and with the uh, with my own religious background, mm. I think the fundamentals of relig religion have been have been forgotten, mm. which is so strong on the unity of the human race. You know, going back right to ancient times, mm. um, right going back to the talking as a Christian, the, the revelation to the Jews, um, God revealing God's self. But the revelation was not made simply for the Jewish nation. It was to the Jewish nation. It was out of the Jewish nation that we got this revelation of God. Um, uh, but it was for all humankind. And in the development, talking as a Christian, the development of Christianity, the understanding of who God is, the very centre of the revelation and most people, you know, it seems such an unintelligible doctrine. God is one, but God is also three persons in one God. And it sounds like theory gone mad, etc. Yeah. But I think it is a most fascinating teaching because you say all this revelation stuff, it's not sim simply about what we call God. Yeah. It's about ourselves too and our self-understanding. And if the very nature of God is communion between three divine persons such that not one of them has something which is theirs and not shared with the others, that the essence of God's life, as we understood, is a sharing, a total sharing, so that as we're 
Father has nothing which isn't equally shared with the Holy Spirit and the Son. Son has nothing which is not equally shared, etc. And we are made in that image. Therefore, the sharing belongs to the absolute essence of our humanity and what our humanity is evolving to become. I think what's really amazing in what you're saying is the way that for you there's a fusion between that radical message about what we need on the social level yes. and that comes at the core of, of your religious yes. faith yes. Um, and it's interesting for me to hear it all as part of the same, mm -hmm. the same because I think for my generation and my generation is not the youngest yes. in terms of yeah. the adult population oh you get over very quickly nowadays yeah <laughs> exactly yeah I'm 31. Oh yes, you're and almost I'm, past it. I'm almost past it already. Um, and I'm a father, uh -huh. so I'm, I am of the older generation yes, in that yes. sense. And this morning, um, at a creative writing workshop, mm -hmm. one of the participants, we realised, was born after I had graduated from high school, uh -huh. which was the same school that I was doing the workshop in. Uh -huh. So they asked me when I left the school and I told them and it was before one of them uh, had even been born. So that was a little reality check. Yeah, sure. So I, I cannot, I'm, I'm, and I'm not attempting to speak for uh, uh, my whole generation, but just as somebody yes. who is 31 mm -hmm. in 2011 in Scotland. Um, mm -hmm. And I just, I think that for, for people in, in my, of my era, mm -hmm. there's, there, there's a scepticism that just comes up as a as a reflex, yes. which is the, the word that I used earlier, mm -hmm. um, just in response to the, uh, in response to, I guess, or as a, an alarm bell around religious doctrine, yes. which in a way denies us any any access to that message mm -hmm. of change that I think many would connect with. Mm -hmm. um, I've I've got experience of being up at. Um, protests at the Fastlane nuclear base oh, yes. and many um, senior citizens of a Christian persuasion yes. being there, putting their bodies on the front line yes. Yes. in protest at uh, nuclear bombs being held yes. on the Clyde. Um, and so I'm aware that such people exist, yes. for people for whom there is no contradiction between uh -huh. Christian faith and um, progressive um, ideas. Yes. Um, and I just think there's there's, it's almost like there's a consensus across set, some generations, my own and I'm sure the younger ones, there's a consensus idea among many that um, the religion that just inevitably is, is divisive yes. rather than um, and oppressive yes. rather than um, the unifying force that you're articulating it can be mm -hmm. uh, you know, in your experience mm -hmm. and I'm in an interesting position in relation to all of that mm -hmm. because my parents met mm -hmm. at the Catholic chaplaincy in Edinburgh mm -hmm. in the 70s. Mm -hmm. My dad was in Edinburgh from Cork mm -hmm. and my mum came over from Glasgow. Both had interesting stories about why they ended up in Edinburgh. Mm -hmm. But that's where they met and that's where they started a family. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was born there. So that's where my roots are. Yes. But they met there. Um, and they met in, in that kind of sanctuary of, of the Catholic chaplaincy and I haven't rebelled against that heritage. Mm -hmm. They raised us within the Catholic tradition, mm -hmm. Catholic, uh, and Catholic education and mm -hmm. going to church. Mm -hmm. And I haven't rebelled against that and nor have I um, ad ad adopted it. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have any specific problem with it mm -hmm. and there was much that was positive about it. Mm -hmm. But it was also so clear to me that it was a skin to shed and move on from. Yeah. Um, so I can see, I, I'm open to it. I'm open to, to what you're saying. <laughs> I'm not I'm not um, I'm not of the opinion that I'm not of the knee jerk opinion that rel mm. uh, the religiosity is a negative force. Um, and it's a shame these yes. days that we, we hear so much about fundamentalism of different kinds. Yes. Yes. That I think, and certainly the kind of uh, an intellectual moral perspective mm -hmm. can easily does like to frame religion as, as a negative influence mm -hmm. in, in the world. Um, 
it's not my take on it, but it's also very clear to me. Um, I do have the um, I do have the experience that I think is common across younger generations of um, almost just wanting to turn off yes. when I when I hear people articulate the, the um, beliefs in such terms. Yeah. And I think that's maybe just because of the need, the way that power has been abused, and the way that societies and structures have failed. Mm-hmm. It doesn't mean that I'm despairing about things, but I think there's a need for new expressions yes. and um, new uh, new perspectives that draw on, on tradition. No, that fascinates me, just what you've been saying. Mm. Because I find with, with age, and particularly in the last, well, call it to say the last 10 years, that feeling of immense sorrow mm. um, on the one hand at what is what is happening and the sorrow is uh, well the sorrow on the one hand but I also thank God for what's happening on the other because I find this crisis is an invitation to change not uh, something to be all this falling away from church going etc I don't see it as a disaster at all I see God can be at work in that can be at work in that and therefore it depends how you look at it. What sort of questions is it forcing you to ask, mm. for example? And I found, I suppose for myself, where I've had all these, I've been through all this, you know, do I really believe, do I not believe, is it, can you really be uh, a Christian, can you remain a Catholic with integrity, seeing as how, what goes on and the way the stuff is preached, etc. I've been through years <laughs> as it were, years of that, um, but I begin to see the Gospels anew, and I see the, the, the uh, Hebrew prophets anew, and I think it is a message which is absolutely vital for human nature, because in the end, it, it is about relationships, and Things that are not stressed enough in our religion, for example, is a vital part of any true religion is that the critical element in us should be developed. Because otherwise, we can't assimilate the message. We can't make it our own. We can't feel part of it. We can feel subject to it. We can feel oppressed by it. We can obey it through fear. But it's not the beginnings of religion. And it's just that uh, if only we could stop um, being so individualist and so afraid of looking. Mm-hmm. I'm talking, when I say we, I'm talking, I suppose, of Christians who still profess belief. Mm-hmm. But uh, we've got to have the courage to look and to say there is need for radical reformation in our understanding of the message. We have, for example, domesticated Christ. Um, And I think the whole way in which we have developed, the development, as you look at it historically, it could be justified at the time. But often we are left with, and from your description, a sort of body of doctrines, as we call them, which as it were, feel that they're imposed on people. They are not benevolent aids to to better living. There are some things which this curious almighty, whoever the almighty might be, imposes on us and assures us that if we don't accept them, we're going to go to hell. You know, you're going to, you may find this life difficult, but my God, hell would be much worse. (laughs) And obviously, who wants to live under that? And it's totally contrary to the gospel and Jesus is saying look I've come to bring you life and God's here to bring you life not death but we have a way of projecting some of our own worst sides or our characters onto God and making God a dominating domineering figure who doesn't leave us an inch to move we've got to be doing God's will all the time so listening to you, um, and the reasons why I, you know, I, you were you were brought up Catholic, etc. 
and said, right, but it's just, I can't, as it were, own it as something which is bringing me life. Um, you can be grateful for some aspects of it. But this dominating figure of God, and that's the reason why, because I think there is a, an, inner, uh, an inner sensing and feel that this God is always beyond us. And this, in my belief, is, is absolutely central. Well, it's not just my belief. For any true believer, is absolutely essential that however you're going to talk about God, God is always the transcendent one. That is, God goes beyond our thinking and our imagining. And nobody can ever give an exact definition of who God is. No human being can ever claim, I know exactly who God is, because they are in control in a way. This God is mysterious, and the, the, the uh, mystical tradition is fascinating. It goes right through the other religions as well. God is not a thing. And you've got one wonderful Christian mystic saying, with a prayer, oh God, deliver me from God. <laughs> I love that prayer. I once saw a bumper sticker, this was in, in the States, in Northwest America, it said, mm -hmm. Jesus, save me from your followers. That's the same. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm interested in what the, um, what the radical action that you would like to see would look like. And if that's just within the, the realm of the religious realm, Mm -hmm. or if that would extend to the radical change needed in the wider, the well, wider let, world. Let me give you an example. I've got a very good friend and I, haven't, I met him in the um, 1950s, the late 50s. I was studying theology in Germany and this wild man from Oregon called Bill Bixel, I met him for the first time and he was over for his studies in Frankfurt. And Bill was not very keen on study at all, but he was the most wonderful character. Now, to put it briefly, Bill, he eventually, he was ordained as a Jesuit. He spent a lot of his life in prison. And the reason he's in prison has always been opposition to nuclear arms mm. and also opposition to the School of the Americas, that awful American institution which trained young men from Central and South America on how to topple governments, how to torture, how to disrupt, etc. And behind it was so that they could support leaders who would allow American interests to be pursued in the various countries. And it was a most iniquitous, well it is a, a most iniquitous organization Bill Mixell has gone in for non-violent protests and he's also found and he was co-founder of what they call a Dorothy Day house in Tacoma, Washington. Dorothy Day was this amazingly radical woman who died in the 1980s, I think early in the 80s, and uh, she became a Catholic. Uh, liturgically, etc., she was a bit on the conservative side. Socially, she was absolutely radical. Went to jail on various occasions for peace protests. Now, I've had something to do with peace people and peace protesters, and I've seen the utter generosity and the total dedication of some of these people. Bill Bixell now is 83. Uh, he's currently in prison in the States, um, serving uh, two sentences, one for... Um, trespassing on a place which makes the nuclear bombs and the other for trespassing, this is at the age of 83 he does this, trespassing on a place which stores the, uh, the biggest store of nuclear arms in the States. He and an 84 year old nun and three others, all in their 60s, older generation, mm. have done this and they were sentenced recently, they were all found guilty. So Bill is, he's got this sentence to serve, he got a fairly light sentence in the end, but it's not really certain. And then 
shortly before that he committed another offence with the place which makes the atomic bombs and what he's been through. When he committed both these offences, he's got a heart condition where the medics say, can't do any more for him. You're liable to drop dead any minute. <laughs> and he's done this. Mm. Now, I see a man like that, and I see the spirit of that man, and I read about his companions. And I think that a remarkable, utter, total self-forgetfulness the object in all that they do is to bring to notice of the American people the damage that this is doing to America, the damage it's doing to the rest of the human race, and they put their lives on the line for it. And that is coming out of their belief that God is the God of love and that the Christ who we keep talking about is not a figure of the past, but somebody whose spirit is still living, and is living in them, and is working in them, and that, for me, is an enormous support. Mm. It's great to hear because um, I think that one of the uh, alarm bells that sounds off for some of all generations, maybe in, in response to religious ideas, mm -hmm. is that the idea that all that the proponents of the religion really want is, is for everyone to convert to that religion. Mm -hmm. That that's, and that there's a, a disconnection from what's going on in human interaction yes. on the social level, the interpersonal yeah. level. Yeah. It's about tuning out from the world and tuning into a higher experience that, for, that some people could view as delusion and others view as enlightenment whatever. Um, and I think that, 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 that it surely is the case that within all religions there's this spectrum from fundamentalism to progressive you know, uh, perspectives and, and I guess different perspectives as to what the religion is for. Yes. If the religion is yeah. for salvation of your soul mm -hmm. or if the religion is for changing the world and changing your relationships. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, 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 it's that area that I think is a shame that gets packaged up with, with the, the loony stuff, to, so to speak. Um, yes. so, and, and for me, it's just so clear that when you talk about the, um, the individualism that's going on, it's like, well, it's so clear to me, I think, that, um, mm -hmm. that that just stems from the economic model that we're living in. Mm -hmm. That that's um, it's inevitable, mm. and I'm sure that over the generations, you've in the decades, yes. you've experienced a change in the culture. Mm. Maybe in previous times of your life, mm. the individualism didn't seem so rampant, mm. but that actually you could possibly trace the growth of it. Mm. And for me, it, it stems from the from the, the social model that we're living in. Mm. It's not the only factor, but I think that's so. When you when you speak about it with reference to people's interpretation of Christianity along really individualistic lines and mm -hmm. not manifesting that sense of the communal, yeah. I think you can apply that to so many other things as well. Mm -hmm. That absence of the communal experience mm -hmm. um, in favour of the isolated individual one, yeah. and I think it's possibly the biggest challenge that mm -hmm. we all face is mm -hmm. to. I just mean on the individual level is mm. to the capacity to reach out past ourselves yes. and um and connect with each other and to have um simply maintaining relationship mm. with others mm. is a huge challenge in the face of um the contemporary world that we're living in and that's why what we fall back on is the is the the, the form of relationships that are sold to us as commodities. Yes. Through yes. various technologies, yes. Yes. and those technologies can play their role in really positive ways in some yes. contexts, yes. of course. But I think that's kind of we're sold a simplified digital version of each other, yes. when actually what we really need mm. is more living, breathing yes. time with each other. Yes. Ironically, some people might share this in conversation through technology, so <laughs> we can't... <laughs> yes, yes, and it's not, yes, the, the sort of destructive of the creative, 
They're not in separate compartments yeah. and you yeah. choose it. No, I think I'll go for the destructive. Mm -hmm. It's never that. Nobody does that. Because they always find some advantage. But the question is, what advantage for what? Mm -hmm. And a, good, a very good question I found is always, deep down inside you, if you had a magic wand mm -hmm. and you had one wish, one desire, because desire determines everything about us, and desire is not something we create, it's something we discover in us. Um, it's, it's, uh, it controls everything. Mm. All our feelings, our future, etc. in desire. Um, now, in Christian doctrine, for example, I can never remember in my upbringing, this may be defective memory, but I can never remember hearing much in a religious context about the importance of desire other than, be careful of it, mm. could lead you to hell. Mm. But God help us. Desire is something deep in our nature. And from a proper understanding of our own Christian doctrine, it's not something um, imposed on us, but it's something most creative, desire. Mm. And, to be, and in order to discover it, you have to be free. And therefore, any religion which is imposing from the outside oughts and shoulds etc is suspect in my eyes so I now have beliefs for example um, I can look back on life and I've found a very interesting thing in life is look at some of the memories which linger in your life you know from years ago and this is just one example but I studied the dead languages, Latin and Greek, in Oxford for four years. And so I read a fair amount of, of uh, Latin literature and Greek literature. But Latin literature, there was a gentleman called Lucretius who lived before Christ. And he thought religion is the cause of all evil. Um, and he dedicated his life to getting rid of religion for the good of human beings. And his theory, it was a very interesting theory, it was from the Greek atomists, who said, really, human beings, we're just a collection of tiny particles. They call them atoms, that which you can't split any further. You know, that's what we're made of. And one day, those are going to separate, disintegrate. That's the end. So don't worry about an afterlife. You're here for the now, and then you disintegrate, and you go back to the stardust from which you're, you've come, etc. Um, but he wrote six beautiful books of poetry on the nature of things and one of them is about the Greek fleet going from Athens to um, what do you call it, Troy mm. to rescue the beautiful Helen who had been kidnapped mm. from Greece and taken over to Troy um, and Agamemnon, one of the Greek leaders, set sail with the Athenian navy to go and rescue Helen from Troy. And on the way, the boat's becalmed. And so the captain goes to the, um, his holy man, whom they always had on board. And the holy man, they got caught and couldn't go any further. There was no wind to take them. And so consulted the holy man, what are we to do to get winds to take us to Troy? And the holy man said, you must sacrifice your daughter Iphigenia, who was travelling on the ship with them, to the, to, the, to, to the gods. And so Lucretius describes the death of this beautiful girl and ends with the thundering lines, which even if you don't know Latin, it, it, they still thunder. Tantum re ligio potuit swadere malorum. What evils religion can do. Now, Lucretius thought fear is the main affliction of humankind. Mm. Fear leads us to do most appalling things to one another. Fear of the afterlife was, in Lucretius' experience, one of the predominant fears, which did lead people to do what Agamemnon did to, and therefore get rid of it. Now, that stuck in my memory. And I kept on remembering those lines. And I didn't know why for years. 
until I began to see that in our own understanding, of, in my own understanding of religion, um, there was something of that, that fear of the gods and could lead me to act inhumanly towards others because they were not doing what I thought God wanted to done, namely everyone to become a Catholic. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But it sounds so crude when you put it now, yeah. but that instant, that's still happening. And that's why people, right, generations change, etc. But not fundamentally change. That's Lucretius speaking from before Christ. And he's put his finger on something. And again, Marxism, um, Marx's manifesto, when you read it, it sounds like the, the Old Testament prophets. And then reading other religions, which before, if you know, brought up as a Catholic, you thought, no, no, there's a false religion, you must pray for their conversion. I found enormous help in Buddhist writers, for example, some of them, some of the Buddhist writers, enormous help and understanding, and also in Hindu writers. And I read a little bit about the is Islamic mystics. Um, so God is huge, God is enormous, and in Christianity, John's wonderful is God is love. Um, no other religion has God expressed quite that way. That is, and that's to be the heart of it. But we have so often turned it into a, a sort of series of rites which will keep you safe. Mm. So I've got a big question for you, mm -hmm. which is um there's, there's, there's lots around the fringes of, of the things that, that we're both saying that I would, that I would love to, to explore mm -hmm. uh, away from this sort of the central kind of, mm -hmm. sort of this issue mm -hmm. about, about religion. Um, would you, in the name of the love part, yes. Yes. would you let go of the word God? Well, I would not let, I don't think let go of the word God, I would explain the word God, mm -hmm. that there are other ways, that happens to be three letters, mm -hmm. but there are other ways of doing it. Um, uh, the power, I'm in the hands of, the, of a power greater than I, is, is, is one way, but simply because God is sort of stamped into our tradition. And our language is very hard to find a suitable alternative, but it's not that. But can you also see that because of that stamping, yes, that's the problem also for me. I do because then they take a particular aspect of it, which they have experienced and has been destructive for them, and therefore they say, "Get rid of God." But it depends on your understanding. Mm. To me, to say, get rid of God, would be equivalent of saying, get rid of humankind. We made nasty people in humankind, so get rid of them. And don't want to. This, and the fascinating thing in Christianity, is the incarnation, which is God, I mean, it's all very mystic, becoming and identifying God's very self yeah. with us. I think the word, the word is a human construct. Yes. It's, yes. it's three letters and yes. it has different uh, different words in different cultures. Yes. Allah or oh, Yahweh. Yes, yes. Um, and you get thousands of them? Yeah, absolutely. So it's just the, 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 the word the word in the English language is all the, yeah. is all that we're talking about. Uh -huh. And just for for me there is a there's a need for radical transformation in how we do things. As a, as a species, I mean, that's really clear. Um, and for me, that the tying up of all that's positive in what you've said into this bundle of this three-letter stamp that has been used oppressively mm -hmm. and to instill, in part, you know, oppressively and to instill fear and conformity mm -hmm. and obedience in people, yeah. and have been abused by power structures, yes, yes. been wielded, yes, and been, yes, you know, been worn. As a butcher's apron and yes. everything. Yes. Um, yes. We're not going to get over it. I don't know. It's. It's. We're not. I. I can't see us. Um, 
I can't see us unpacking that so easily. The Jews, for example, didn't, didn't, wouldn't use the word and still object to our translation of, in the Hebrew scriptures, Yahweh. Mm. Um, mm. And that business of, uh, who are you? And God giving God's name said, I am who I am. Just, I am, that's, that's the, the name. But um, Yahweh, they, they wouldn't use. And the, the, the scriptures themselves have literally hundreds of different descriptions of God. And different religions, um, Hinduism or paganism, have multiple gods. Hinduism has multiple gods, yes. Yeah. yes. So maybe there's a way in which the monotheistic traditions, maybe there's a way in which that is too much of a perfect match for oppressive pyramid structure hierarchies or patriarchies that people can easily adopt that monotheism because it corresponds to the oppressive social structures <laughs> um, maybe the maybe the maybe the many theistic traditions probably not the right phrase but maybe they offer more of a model of um, how we can move forward together as a diverse species. Well, again, if you look at it in another way, the, the Jewish people were the first monotheists, mm. in, and all the people surrounding them thought in a multitude of gods, mm. and there are traces in the Hebrew scriptures of many gods. Mm. Elohim is a pl plural word, etc. Mm. But it was it's the monotheism which was the, the, there is one God and no other, which was so revolutionary. And also, as for people, it made such a difference because human beings are no longer the shackles or the, the, the slaves of this multitude of gods living outside space somewhere who are riotous in their behavior and the rest. And you've got to count out to them and you must do this and you must do that. Done with that. And you have this one God who creates human beings in God's own image and likeness. That is a profound statement about it. And that is what has given it the strength. And so the what they call the Abrahamic religions mm -hmm. all stem from this. Islam, Christianity and Judaism. And they originated in the desert. In the desert. And yes. I think that's of significance mm -hmm. in terms of the human experience yes. of, of, of the world around yes. in the physical, spiritual mm -hmm. realm, on multiple realms. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a place with not a lot else going on. And so yes. you look at the um, yes. you look at the pagan tradition yes. in this part of the world, the, the indigenous, yes. as it were, religion, and that's a world of many gods. The gods of the rivers, of the plants, yes. of the birds. Yes, yes. yes. Um, there's just a bit more going on than in the desert. I'm not saying that's the only defining um, factor, but for me, it's relevant. Well, the desert is very, very important, and that in religious tradition, mm -hmm. not just Christian, the desert has been the place of revelation. Mm -hmm. And that's why in Christianity, the early monastic movement, which incidentally, was a, a lay movement um, and people, where did they go? They went first to cemeteries because they thought the spirits reveal themselves more and the evil spirits too, you become aware of them. Mm. And the beginning of the monastic movement was the awareness that once Christianity became the official religion of the empire, people lost their power of discernment and therefore they were liable to just fall for Roman power. Hence, the clergy got dressed up in these elaborate vestments, which were vestments of senators, they were things of rank. And when you read the Gospel, Jesus was not in favour of rank, and Jesus was extraordinary in his attitude towards power and authority. Is the one thing on the Gospels on which he is utterly clear about the future organisation 
is the way authority must be exercised. You must be servants to one another, not dominating. Um, so it's, it's, uh, it's fascinating stuff, but the thing that God is at work everywhere, in everyone, and we have to listen to one another, and other religions can be giving us messages which in fact enhance our own understanding of our Christianity. And I've lived with, uh, with, with men who've dedicated their lives to interfaith work. Mm. And every single one of them I've chatted with, they say, in fact, this has deepened my understanding of my own Christianity. And it's these other religions which have thrown light on something I never saw before. Mm. So listen, I'm just wondering, we've gone on for a fair time. <coughs> well, we've done, it was really, really good. We've done three quarters of an hour. Yeah. Uh, and that, just, I've, I've stopped writing things down. Um, we've actually covered so many areas that are fundamental to this whole series of conversations mm -hmm. um, and take us, in a sense, to the whole thing of this global village and envisioning the future. Yes. Um, I think some of the technology stuff was very interesting. I think it was interesting, the last time I was in Tanzania, there was somebody there talking about the difference between the African approach and the European approach. Yes. And they summarised that as the the European Western approach is I am, whereas the African approach is we are. And they define themselves by the relationship and community. And it was interesting when you're talking about technology, because the one issue in looking at the global village aspect in terms of communication is the transformation, not over decades, but within a year or two, of the arrival of technology. So whether it's television, that I think acts almost like a Trojan horse, when you have technology coming in like that, the communication, the storytelling, the sense of belonging, family relationships are beginning to splinter. Mm -hmm. And that through the sort of dialogue we're doing here, both in terms of cross-generational, and when we then apply that across culture and look at what is in common and what's not, then I feel... <laughs> like this conversation, which, okay, we have a short, brief digital record of, yeah. but it's plumbing into something that needs to happen. And I know, Jerry, when I'd spoken to you earlier about this idea of having conversations mm -hmm. in order, whether it's passing the baton or whether it's, as I mentioned, the sort of last will and testament idea, it, 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 it's having a testament to what you know mm -hmm. and having a will that's passed on to other people but it's not just a handing over, because that can be a book or a document. It's a living communication. Mm -hmm, yeah. And then how to involve other people in that dialogue, which is, it's not quite ephemeral, but it, it has to be real. Yes. And so the whole vision and venture of what we're about at the moment in the whole festival thing and beyond mm -hmm. that, and because it's already moving beyond, is how to engage people in positive, constructive dialogue mm -hmm. with each other. And it's not about control, mm -hmm. and it's not coming out of fear, which was another theme we were talking yeah, about. Yeah. And it is, it, it's, is, is the question, you know, is unity possible, mm -hmm. or is it just an unrealistic, illusory desire? Yes. Um, and mm -hmm. is community possible, not only notional, yeah. and how do we get back mm -hmm. our sense of we, yes. without at the same time, you know, being conscious that this way that we live is now being delivered mm -hmm. to the other part of the world. Yes. Um, and that's, yeah. so I, I think we've really moved into the essence of, of what all this is about in a way that feels bigger, yes. but personally what I can contain yes. in my head and heart at the yes. moment. Yes. And you know, there's a whole thing there that I've mentioned, but I lived for a time, for a very short time, with the Aborigines. And I went there um, simply because I'd read about them, and I, I was just fascinated by the description of the of the theology of the Aborigines. Mm -hmm. and no written language. Um, in Australia, for example, the Aborigines lived 
they never had buildings, never had, had buildings. Um, they were never agricultural people, they just wandered, hence the walking, found the food there. But they had an extraordinarily complex sort of mentality um, and, the, you know, the, the, the dreaming and all the rest they talk about. It was very, very complex. But living with them, one of the very striking things was, we were being told, look, if you're working with children, teaching children, never, can, never um, praise an individual. It will make them embarrassed. Mm. Because you, you praise the group, not the individual. They didn't have the notion that we've got of the I. It's, we are a sort of kinship group. And this, their early training, particularly, well, I think for the men and the women, um, they were taken away and, as it were, trained in, in proper Aboriginal behaviour when they were about 14 or 15. But before that, they're just allowed to run, run wild. And things of personal property, they didn't have a relationship to property which we have mm. at all. And the story is that Captain Cook arrived full of goodwill bringing all sorts of interesting things like clocks, etc., and presenting these to the Aborigines who listened to them and admired them and then left them in the sand and walked away. And they're not interested. They didn't in them. need them. They didn't need them. I think there's something huge in, in the story of the Aboriginal experience yes. from mm -hmm. my understanding, which is really limited. Yes. Uh -huh. And that is a sense of equilibrium that lasted from thousands of years. Thousands of years. And they reckon at least 50,000 years and it's the sociologists, mm. not the religious people, who have discovered the depth of spirituality which is in these people. Mm. There was an Anglican divine, um, I think it was about 18th century, and he's writing back from Australia and saying, you know, I always took it for granted that we have a natural knowledge of God, a natural desire for God. This is not true among the Aborigines. They have no religion or whatever. Now, this is himself writing with great certainty in the, I think it's 17th or maybe 18th century. The sociologists today are saying there probably has never been such a religious people as the Aborigines. And with a deep and very complex thought system, but no written language, no buildings, no clothes, until Captain Cook came and put them in their proper clothing, you know. <laughs> Mm. Show them how to wear clothes. When I was there, I visited once an outpost from, I was in a little place called Balgo, which had something like 300 inhabitants or 300 adults, of whom 200 were registered artists. They never trained as an art school, they just had it naturally. Most magnificent uh, Aboriginal style paintings, etc., which they did. Art dealers used to come flying up in a little plane to Balgo every now and again to purchase these, these uh, pictures. Um, but these people had no notion of I, as we understand it, we are we. Um, and there was an identification with the group. And they also, I read, I read about this, they're, they're, um, well no, I also heard about it from people who had experienced it their ability to communicate with one another across huge distances. Um, and I met um, a sister, a religious sister, who came over from Europe, been a missionary in, among the Aborigines. And shortly after her arrival at Balgo with one other, they went off in the car one day and they got lost. Very dangerous to get lost, particularly in the summertime in, in, in Australia. You could die of thirst within a few hours. The people at Balgo realised they had not come back on time. The elders got together, they sat in a group, they summoned the youngsters, and they directed the youngsters from Balgo as to how to find these women. So they were walking maybe 100 miles or something, but they were directed by these men back at Balgo by telepathy. And they found the sisters, they were discovered on the third day. And one of them was telling me this, this account. Wow. But these extraordinary powers, which means that's latent in human beings, if we could get back to it, 
I mean, without idealising mm. that um, that kind of culture, yes. that ethnicity, mm. I think um, <coughs> there's a model there you talk about a, a deep sense of religion and spirituality, yes. Yes. where that is inseparable, inseparable from creativity and yes. community, yes. and from an ecologically sustainable system. way of life. Yes. And so I think, I mean, that is what we want. <laughs> we want all those things together. There's no report of wars between them, mm -hmm. but they had some pretty cruel laws, you know, yeah. within their group. Yeah, no doubt. And pretty ruthless. Yeah. However. So, um, it's been great to chat. <laughs> it has been great. So, but it's marvellous. Mm -hmm. Once, once mm -hmm. you start the chatting, mm -hmm. But I find it goes on so rarely. Mm. I think, particularly among the older generation, mm. and living with a lot of you know Christian context. But I find this appalling that in the biggest crisis which has ever hit Christianity, which is hitting it now, mm. there's hardly any discussion about it. There's talk about about religion and. As somebody said, how you arrange the deck chairs on the Titanic it becomes a sort of major thing. But not, what could God be saying to us through this? And what steps should we take? Mm -hmm. And it's nothing elaborate, it's nothing mysterious. But one of the vital things is get people talking and teach them, if they need it, how to talk in a non-violent manner with one another. So you don't divide into groups. And the whole business of communicating non-violently mm. is at the heart of the Gospel of the Sermon on the Mount. And people have picked it up from all religions and none. And tremendous work has been done, much of it not publicised, on that, on reconciliation, etc. And there's the heart of it. And why we can't bring that in and why we have to live in a hierarchical society and a hierarchical church. So historically it's not necessary. <laughs>